And I would like to highlight the three major contributions that the guiding principles on extreme poverty and human rights make to this topic under discussion. First, paragraph 99 of the guiding principles on extreme poverty and human rights says the following, where transnational corporations are involved, all relevant states should cooperate to ensure that business respects human rights abroad, including the human rights of persons and communities living in poverty. Now, this not only recognizes that states have extraterritorial obligations, duties to control the corporations over which they can exercise influence, it also recognizes the duty of states to cooperate with one another to address the specific, the specific source of impunity that results from the transnationalization of economic activity, businesses operating across jurisdictions. And these are important contributions of the guiding principles on extreme poverty and human rights that in that regard go beyond the guiding principles on business and human rights, although these are dimensions that are um, often underemphasized in our political discussions. They are present in the legally binding instrument under negotiation at the Human Rights Council on Business and Human Rights. My second remark is that the guiding principles on extreme poverty and human rights put lots of emphasis on the value of participation of people in poverty. Part of the foundational principles of the guiding principles on extreme poverty and human rights is about the agency and autonomy of persons living in extreme poverty. And participation is not only a human right um, recognized um, under Article 25 of the International Covenant on Civil and Political Rights, it also is essential to understand and address what ATD Fourth World and others call the hidden dimensions of poverty that go beyond lack of decent work and lack of income. And that include institutional and social maltreatment and discrimination, lack of recognition of the contribution of people in poverty to um, society or disempowerment. Sometimes public policies or investment projects that increase wealth, that improve um, uh, GDP, may be undermining other dimensions of livelihoods. For example, when solidarity networks are broken down by the privatization of the commons, when foreign investors enter a country and crowd out uh, smaller size local firms, or when um, informal workers are marginalized, such as treat vendors, as a result of the growth of um, larger um, uh, supply chains. In order to identify the full range of the impacts resulting from new investments or new business activities, I believe that people in poverty should be allowed to participate effectively in designing the regulatory and policy frameworks to guide the investment. Participation should not be tokenistic. It should not be simply about being consulted once all choices have been made in order to allow for some marginal improvements to take place. It should be about the right to co-design the project. In other terms, decision-making power should be shared. It should be a right to receive answers to the concerns raised so as to improve accountability. Now, this is what we find in various instruments that refer to the right to participation, such as particularly the guidelines for states on the effective implementation of the right to participate in public affairs presented by the Office of the High Commissioner for Human Rights in July 2018, or the report of my predecessor, Magdalena Sepulveda Carmona, um, on the right to participation presented in 2014 at the 26th session of the Human Rights Council. In 2001, the Committee on Economic, Social and Cultural Rights adopted a declaration on poverty and the International Covenant on Economic, Social and Cultural Rights that says the following, and I quote, a policy or program that is formulated without the active and informed participation of those affected is most unlikely to be effective. 